Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Fulbrighters. We are delighted to uh, have you with us virtually. And um, virtual meetings, I suppose, are one benefit of the difficult years we all went through not too long ago. My name is Dr. Bob Gervaisi, and I have the honor of serving as chair of the board of directors of the Fulbright Association. And uh, I'm also joined by John, Dr. John Bader, who is the executive director of the association, and Dr. Will Vokey, who is the treasurer and chair of the finance committee. And he is really stalwart because he is tuning in from Taiwan, where it's a little advanced time-wise from us. I, and I think he probably just got up. <laughs> so good to have you all. I should mention, I, I just started my term as chair of the board of directors of the Fulbright Association, and it is truly one of the great honors of my whole career. I have had the honor and the privilege of holding the title of president of three higher ed, actually four higher ed institutions in my career. First, the Institute for Study Abroad in Indianapolis, then Quincy University in Illinois, then the Ohio Dominican University in Columbus, Ohio, and most recently as an interim president at the University of Mount Union in Northern uh, Ohio. I have to say, however, that being involved with the Fulbright Association has truly been a highlight uh, of my of the last really four or five years uh, when I first got to meet John Bader. So I don't know I don't know uh, how long you all have been involved with the Fulbright Association, but we are so glad you are here tonight, and we encourage you to continue to stay involved and to encourage others to do so as well. Tonight, we are going to be looking at the year just passed. John will lead us through that. And then Will will lead us through the year just passed in numbers. And Will does a great job of keeping track of the uh, organization's finances. I will then give you a brief overview of our strategic plan. And John will conclude the formal presentations with a preview of activities in the coming year. But we want to leave as much time as possible for you so that we want this to be as much a conversation, not just a presentation, although presentations are unavoidable. But think about your questions and answers, and you can submit them online through the Q&A. So with that, I will turn it over to John. Well, good evening, everyone, and and welcome. It's always uh, an important and delightful moment for those of us who uh, uh, work and support this community to talk to all of you as members of our association. We're deeply grateful for your engagement, for your membership, for your support, and all of the volunteering that you do throughout the year. Indeed, uh, that uh, your life is an extension of the program in so many ways, and, and we're, we're gratified that you're here with us. Um, as Bob mentioned, um, I'll be walking through a, a couple pieces uh, summarizing how what the work we did in 2023, but of course, we're happy to, in the Q&A session, uh, talk to you more about uh, particular programs you'd like to hear more about and the like. Um, so let's get started. Uh, before I do that, just um, just a quick uh, reminder of who I am. I've been your executive director for uh, seven years. This is my eighth year. Uh, it's a great honor to serve this community. I was a Fulbrighter to India, um, and uh, I've been a, a college dean and professor, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be chatting with you this evening. Okay. So as we look back on some of the highlights from 2023, at the top of that list would be our Fulbright Prize event, where we honored Drs. Kazmikia Corbett and Anthony Fauci. It was uh, an extraordinary event. We had about 500 people in the room, thousands of people online watching uh, this uh, conversation about uh, the importance of vaccines and science and public health and its positive effect on the, the control of the pandemic and our ability to restore uh, life as, as we would like it to be. Um, 
We uh, were grateful for uh, sponsors, donors, uh, those who registered. It was a it was a, f a fine evening. Members of Congress and the diplomatic corps were there, and uh, uh, we thought it was uh, an important moment. Uh, Congressman John Sarbanes, who is an alumnus of ours, he did his Fulbright to Greece, took me aside and said, this is a, a very important evening because it raises the profile of the Fulbright program. And that is so important uh, here in Washington and across the world. Um, uh, the next day, we did an advocacy day. Uh, where we uh, uh, large groups went all over Capitol Hill to make our case for increased funding for the Fulbright program in the face of uh, a split Congress and uh, high levels of partisanship. The Fulbright program has been profoundly nonpartisan or at least bipartisan for decades. So we had uh, friendly conversations that were very important. That advocacy day followed weeks of efforts by our chapters to reach out to local congressional offices and make the same case. Uh, it is so important that we stay uh, vigilant and uh, vocal in our support of the program and make sure that policymakers best better understand it. Uh, about a month later, we had a trip to Spain and Portugal through our travel program. We had record numbers of folks uh, join us on that, uh, on that trip. Um, uh, a few months after that, we were gathering in Denver, um, where we had our national conference, which was well attended by over 300 folks from all over the country, although a heavy representation from the West and from Colorado, as you would expect. A really dynamic gathering that started with a youth summit. This was a, an important first, um, uh, first time for this program where we had over 100 students from underrepresented communities in Denver um, who came to an afternoon of, um, of uh, workshops and uh, conversation about the importance and the, uh, and the joys of studying abroad. Uh, one of our important initiatives this year was the Youth Summit. Um, and uh, Leland Lazarus and uh, Wen Kuni Siant, were, who are now both on our board, Leland was already on our board, um, led that uh, important effort uh, as part of our uh, uh, a really crucial DE&I initiative. Uh, the conference followed, as I mentioned, very well attended, an incredible conversation about uh, the future and how to make the world a better place. Lots of great presentations, wonderful uh, plenaries. We uh, we were very uh, fortunate to have uh, folks from Congress, from uh, uh, from uh, uh, the Academy. It was uh, a really tremendous gathering. Um, another highlight this year is the fuller launch of our mentoring program. Uh, this uh, has been an important initiative that we've been developing over several years. We continue to grow that, refine it in such a way that there's a great match between uh, older uh, or more senior uh, Fulbrighters and young professionals to, to really support them. We're doing that in, uh, in conjunction and in cooperation with commissions around the world because uh, it's so important that uh, current grantees also feel that level of support. Life Chats was an important uh, uh, new initiative this year where we had our lifetime members join on a regular basis, on a monthly basis, to share stories on particular themes. A lot of engagement, a lot of energy. It was uh, a, a really great program. We want to thank Allison Gardy uh, for, for leading that uh, for us. Bob will be talking about strategic planning. This is uh, a lot of hard work and, and thought went into uh, this process this year, as we think about uh, ourselves and how to move forward in a positive way, he'll he'll be explaining the outcome of that in just a moment. Uh, you, you won't see this necessarily as clearly as we do, but a very important initiative was our transition from an old customer relations uh, uh, system to Salesforce. Many of you have probably encountered this in your professional lives. We now have a much more professional, interactive, and future-proof uh, and adaptable uh, a database. This will allow us to better know who you are, better serve you, um, uh, make it easier for you to interface with the with the FA at all times. Uh, a really important moment. Um, 
Finally, membership and fundraising continue to grow. We appreciate all the efforts that uh, that our chapters make, our institutional members make to grow our uh, our community and to make it vibrant and uh, um, and responsive. Uh, one more uh, slide here, just to, to highlight the important work of our chapters. Um, our chapters do extraordinary work. They're really the foundation of our organization. Um, and uh, this year, uh, a lot of vibrant new programming across the country. Much of that programming is funded by a grant from the, uh, the State Department's uh, Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, uh, ECA. Uh, ECA has been funding chapter grants for many years, and their generosity and commitment to the growth and engagement of our chapters is essential. And we're we're grateful to our colleagues at ECA for for their support and collegiality. Um, in in Denver, we we awarded uh, many of our chapters and leaders with uh, with our recognition of their outstanding contributions to our community. You'll see them listed here on your screen, of course. Um, Julia Totskaya in, in South Florida, uh, a very uh, 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 a dynamic and innovative leader in South Florida. Uh, Rui Pritchard, she uh, 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 offered all kinds of important leadership and has for many years in North Carolina. The Minnesota chapter is one of our most creative chapters. Uh, they offered outstanding programs throughout the year, and we recognize their creativity and the engagement of, of their board. Um, we also uh, note that, um, that many chapters are doing e extraordinary and important virtual programs. So the New Hampshire chapter did a very, very powerful uh, series on genocide. Um, obviously, a highly topical and difficult, um, a difficult topic, but but one that uh, engendered a lot of support and a lot of great conversations. Uh, our Fulbrighters with Disabilities chapter has been so instrumental in moving us forward on diversity questions, uh, offering uh, webinars and uh, advocacy. One of the important innovations at our conference was a, a quiet room that uh, was was led and uh, uh, and uh, staffed and and populated by folks from uh, this particular chapter. So we're grateful to them. Glenn Harrison has been a uh, an important advocacy leader in Arkansas for many years. Um, he is one of a whole network of advocacy directors across the country. We'll be talking more about advocacy after the strategic plan. And finally, the Colorado chapter for doing such an incredibly diverse group of public service projects. Uh, Colorado was also, as you might imagine, instrumental in the success of our, of our uh, national conference. So we have many people to thank, uh, all of our in individual and institutional members, uh, those who have uh, given the association grants, donations, sponsorships, we cannot do the programming that we do without the generosity of all these people. I've mentioned uh, chapter leaders and their boards. There are nearly 700 uh, chapter leaders and board members across this country. We now have uh, uh, more than 60 chapters across the country in 43 states. That's an extraordinary uh, community of volunteerism and we're so proud and so grateful. Um, Advocacy volunteers, both uh, at the chapter level and at the national level, very important, as I mentioned, to uh, to speaking up for Fulbright. Our national board members, you're seeing Bob and Will right now. You're not seeing the 18 others who give their time, treasure, and talents in so many ways. Um, in, in the background, you, you, you just don't see how important they are to our success uh, strategically, uh, uh, politically, um, financially, and much, much more. Uh, and then finally, our uh, uh, travel program subcommittee members who have been so important in the development of, of that travel program. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Will. Um, Will is uh, the, uh, the retired director of the program in Taiwan. 
um, a, a leader of many nonprofits and a mentor to me. And uh, and I've been grateful for his leadership and and support throughout the years uh, in so many capacities. Will, it's uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce you. And you can take yourself off uh, mute, please. Thank you, John. Um, I've been uh, treasurer of the Fulbright Board now going into my fifth year. Um, I'll have another year at this and then hopefully pass it on to somebody else. Thank you for the introduction. I'll give you, a, I'll give members a little bit more background. Uh, I'm essentially a, a traveling, a trailing spouse and a recovering academic. I led the World Affairs Councils of America for a while and have been a professor um, and have also led several other nonprofits and was with the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs in New York City for a period. My wife is a Taiwanese diplomat. And she has also retired, and we are now living um, half the year in Taiwan, two-thirds of the year in Taiwan, and the rest with grandchildren in North Carolina. Um, let me make four points here in my opening remarks and then take us to the numbers. Uh, first point about finances. Um, our budget was, and our actuals were only about 1.5% different this year. Uh, that's a wonderful outcome uh, that we are able to project our income and our expenses close enough to be that close to our actual budget at the beginning of the year. I have to say we're much better at projecting expenses than we are revenue. Uh, and we, I think that the um, staff has a really good handle on keeping expenses to a minimum. Uh, also on finances, you will see later on a $16,000 deficit for the year. Uh, as opposed to a projected $6,000 surplus. Um, while that's important and we don't like a deficit of any kind, um, that is within manageable amounts. And uh, we're happy that that's come out at that point. Finally, just a technical point, uh, that $16,000 deficit does not reflect the fact that we invested 35,000 on a grant from the State Department in Salesforce and the auditing principles require us to use that as a capital investment for an asset. So when our audit report comes out from our uh, independent auditor, it will show that $35,000 actually as an asset and will show us with a balance for the year of 20,000. In other words, 35,000 minus 16,000, which is the deficit. Um, that will show as, as a balance for the year. So our audit report won't directly reflect the numbers I'm going to give you today, but I'm going to give you these numbers because even though that's an asset, we can't turn that into cash and we can't use that for ongoing um, expenses. Uh, in that regard, our cash flow has been great. Uh, we are in a good situation where we have been able to manage all our expenses. Um, the income and expenses vary dramatically during the year. So for instance, uh, the prize is both a big income and a big expense, and that will be May 17th this year. Um, donations generally come in heaviest in November and December. So our cash flow has to exist to manage those up and downs because of course, things like salaries are paid on a monthly basis and we have been in good shape in terms of cash flow. So that's the overview on finances. My second point has to do with financial strategy. There have been several important strategic financial decisions that have been made by the board and the staff in this last several years, and I want to go over them with you. The first is to continue to focus on advocacy. Advocacy is really important for the Fulbright program. The Fulbright program itself is underfunded. We are significantly behind, 20 to 30 percent behind funding at in, of the year 2010, uh, if you think of that including inflation, and if we go back a long ways to the 50s and 60s, we're even much more dramatically behind the funding then. And it's important to keep Congress involved and understand about the funding for the program. And in fact, the program would be much less successful if it weren't for the fact that one quarter to one third of the monies in the program are now generated overseas by the commission countries, the 49 programs that have commissions. So advocacy is a crucial part and advocacy doesn't, doesn't generate any income. Uh, we have to generate income otherwise to cover advocacy. For the prize, we decided to, to run a three-year trial to do the prize every year, both as a uh, instrument for visibility and also as an instrument for income. This is our third year in that. Uh, and that's something that we have invested in. 
Thirdly, we, in terms of financial strategy, we decided to try to finance a full six person staff of professionals rather than relying on kind of the rotating group of, of young people that often run through nonprofit offices um, in Washington, DC. Uh, we believe we have got a good staff. Uh, you have to pay a good staff well. And in order to fund the, the prize and fund the staff, we have agreed in terms of a financial strategy to take monies out of the endowment in terms of not the principal, but in terms of the income, the invest, the um, interest and dividends. So we have been funding some of that uh, financial strategy to meet the advocacy prize and staffing issues with endowment income, not principal, uh, for the last three years. That brings me to the third point, the endowment. <clears throat> we have taken a position on the endowment in the last several years, which is essentially a hands-off, minimum involvement, uh, market-based market uh, buying of Vanguard funds, uh, kind of across the board, 60-40 distribution of equities to uh, fixed assets, um, and it's believed by the members of the Finance Committee and the board that it may be possible to get a better return on our endowment if we have slightly more active management and we know we'll get better financial advice. So the board has decided to take half of the endowment and put it with a uh, advisory group. Uh, we vetted, we put out a tender, vetted four groups and came up with Wilmington Trust as the potential uh, manager of one half of the endowment. Uh, and we will be doing that in this next year to see if we can get a better return on endowment than we have uh, with the hands-off process. Uh, and we're very happy with that. And we're doing it. Uh, the hands-off process is an, an incredibly conservative way to do this. This is a slightly less conservative way, and we're hopeful that that's going to be successful. The fourth point I need to make is about policies. During this last year, the Finance Committee and then the board did a complete 360 review of all our financial policies and updated those. We found out with um, help from an outside consultant and from our accountants um, that we were actually in really good shape in our financial policies and in our financial processes. But we updated all those, made them even stronger, and they are part of both a financial policies document an internal process document and an employee handbook, which have all been updated and fit with that. And we're really pleased to tell you that we think that the financial oversight of the Fulbright Association is as strong as it could possibly be. Um, now let me take you to the numbers. John, could you put up the first slide? So this is the uh, revenue allocation, the revenue allocation for 20. 2023. You'll see that in terms of revenue, um, uh, the largest piece of those revenues are development, the Fulbright Prize, membership, and chapters. And by chapters, that's essentially a grant from ECA. That's a grant from the State Department. Um, those have been the four big um, pieces of our income stream. John, the next slide, please. And this is our expenses. And you'll see that our expenses have gone to uh, administration, pass-throughs to chapters, because a lot of that money that comes from ECA is simply a pass-through that comes from ECA and goes on to chapters. This year, it also funded Salesforce, the Fulbright Prize, and the conference. Um, and those are our big expense items. Uh, admin is also 22%. Uh, John, next slide, please. I'm sorry if I'm going through this too fast. Uh, if you all have questions about the details on it when we come back to it at the end for questions and answers, I'll be happy to do that. These, This is our 2023 revenue budget versus actuals. You'll notice that under advocacy, there is no revenue. You'll notice under membership, our membership was down from what we budgeted. We need help from you with that. We need help from you going to your institutions and asking your institutions to become institutional members and from you by recruiting other people to be members of the Fulbright Association. You'll note that the annual conference um, in October did better than expected, and that was because of very, very strong sponsorship. The chapters, of course, were more than we expected. We got an extra grant this year from ECA, which helped us with uh, Salesforce. 
uh, and the prize uh, did less than expected, and we were surprised at that. We think that was probably because, although we hadn't considered at the time, the selection of Dr. Fauci as a prize recipient had a political overtone to it that we weren't expecting. The travel program is uh, less than expected simply because we had one less program than we expected. We were expecting two, and the second program did not materialize, and that's why that was down. The endowment draw was exactly what we expected, and donations were just a little bit above the expected amount. And we want to congratulate Claire and John for the wonderful job they did in soliciting donations this year. Uh, so our total income was $1,572,000. Next slide, John. Our expenses, uh, you'll see that the advocacy expenses were down this year, that the membership expenses were down, that the conference expenses were down. This is all in line with good staffing and good staff management. That the chapter expenses were up, and they were up because we got more funding that we could pass through to chapters. That the prize expenses were down. Travel expenses were down because uh, we had one less travel grant, and that's essentially a pass-through paying for expenses for travel. Fundraising expenses were slightly up. And as I mentioned in my first point, administrative expenses were up because we have decided to hire and try to keep a very professional staff. So you can see that the result here is instead of a $6,000 um, budget surplus was a 16,000, almost $17,000 budget deficit. As I mentioned before, uh, we're happy with this outcome. We do need your help. We need your help with membership. We need your help with donations. Uh, you might also consider a legacy gift. We have a new legacy program in place. Uh, and if you're able to and interested in it, please contact Claire about the legacy program and um, make a contribution in your will. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Overall, as I noted, the Fulbright program globally is underfunded. And the Fulbright Association, one of the Fulbright Association's main task is try to help create this program to be the small barrier against the kind of conflicts we see occurring in the world now. Senator Fulbright, in creating this program back in 1946, basically, and I'll, I'll paraphrase him, basically said that uh, there have been great tragedies in the world with World War I and World War II. And the Fulbright program, the International Education Exchange Program, is one small measure to help prevent those kind of tragedies. And although it's a small measure, it's one of the best measures we have. So I hope that you will continue your support for the Fulbright program and help us in the future. Thank you, John. Thank you, Will. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, back to you, Bob. Thank you, John. I'm going to briefly outline uh, the results of a lot of work by a lot of people in articulating a strategic plan for the association. I remember a strategic plan retreat that um, the board hosted in Washington about a year ago, wasn't it? Or maybe, yeah, and it was, it was a really excellent, excellent day. So there, the plan really has three pillars uh, prompted by the organization's vision and mission. The vision statement. Um, a peaceful and cooperative world advanced through international educational exchange and cultural immersion. And I have to tell you, uh, honestly, as I read this, it seems so impossible right now. It could seem so impossible. I mean, it's just very difficult to read the news these days. And that's why the impossible can be possible if people of goodwill, if thousands, hundreds of thousands of Fulbrighters and their supporters come together to make this vision real. And that from that vision flows the mission of the organization to, to engage, serve, and support a diverse, inclusive, and growing network dedicated to the Fulbright principle of cooperation through mutual understanding. And I want to emphasize that it's 
a diverse, inclusive, and growing network. It's not just Fulbright alums, although that's the biggest piece, but it's anyone who supports the Fulbright vision and mission. So we want to encourage you to spread the word, not only to other colleagues who have had the incredible privilege of being Fulbrighters abroad, but also anyone who cares about a peaceful and cooperative world. As, as Will said so eloquently, the Fulbright program is a small piece of that vision, but it is a powerful piece. And each one of us can make it even more powerful. Next slide, please. The first pillar, champion the vision of the Fulbright program. How are we going to advance this vision? Importantly, we want to build strategic partnerships that deepen and broaden the association's existing network and engage new stakeholders. This happened in at the Fulbright uh, conference in Denver. Uh, I was really impressed with the, the incredible support of United Airlines. Uh, in supporting that conference and therefore the association. Develop new digital initiatives that are international in scope, audience, and subject matter to engage alumni worldwide. As I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation, uh, the, the, the Zoom world has its benefits, and we're going to make more, as much use of, of online initiatives, digital initiatives, as we can and in just a minute, John's going to give you some very specific ways in which we're going to get that going this year in 2024. Finally, in pillar one, share information on the impact of the Fulbright experience with policymakers while reminding them of the original Fulbright program vision and advocating for continued and increased funding support. So advocacy, core to what we want to do on the ground. Next slide, please. Key pillar two, increase membership and prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion. You've already heard this. This basically puts it in writing. We need to leverage and increase support for chapters and emerging interest groups, including strategic advising, more effective communications, membership and leadership development, and program innovation. Each one of us can make a difference. Develop hybrid programming that brings diverse communities together while expanding global access, as I mentioned earlier. And then finally, for key pillar two, deliver programs, benefits, and resources that meet the needs of more individual and institutional members. And I want to congratulate John and his team for really thinking this through and thinking of new ways to reach out to more individuals and more institutional members. Next slide, please. Key pillar three, strengthen the Fulbright Association's financial model. You heard uh, Will's outstanding report. This builds on where we are. We, we do have excellent oversight. So we wanna create a comprehensive development and fundraising plan that is consistent with uh, FA's vision and mission. You saw in the financials that fundraising really accounts for about, separate from memberships, but just donations, accounts for about $400,000 of our budget. We wanna see if we can really improve that, uh, increase that exponentially, even though the team has done an incredible job to get to that point. We wanna identify, build, sustain, and leverage more and stronger sponsor relationships. And one of the things John and I specifically, uh, we meet weekly to talk about the association. One of the things we're gonna be looking at right now, up to now, we, we spend a lot of time trying to identify sponsors for events, particularly the prize gala and the annual uh, 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 association conference. Those efforts are very important and need to be continued. But what we need to also do is try to identify sponsor relationships for the organization as a whole. 
uh, sponsors who are excited about our vision and mission overall, not just a specific event, so that we can have a network of strong, supportive relationships that we can count on regardless of what the prize gala is going to bring in and what the conference is going to bring in. Finally, establish new revenue streams and funding models that complement uh, FAA's membership model that augment the operating budget and that use resources efficiently and drive the mission. And John and I have already begun to have some conversations about this, and we will bring some of those up at the next board meeting in March. All right, um, with that, I think uh, it goes back to John with uh, an overview of what will be happening in 2024. John. John, are you on mute? Uh, I often uh, uh, I often mock people who forget to uh, un uh, unmute, uh, and then so I deserve that. Uh, thank you. Oh, that's all right. I just rarely think of you as mute. <laughs> <laughs> touche, touche. <laughs> um, I um, uh, I I wanted to uh, to thank you, Bob, for a, a great presentation on our strategy, and also to underscore that that is a multi year strategy as yes. we think about our growth over a five-year period. Uh, each year we'll be revisiting uh, the, the success of, of that strategy as a, as a means to growth and success and advancement of our mission. My team is charged each year with an implementation plan and then executing on that plan. And so I'll, for a few minutes, uh, give you a, a quick sense of what we're gonna be working on this year. Uh, we are now at the, um, at about 20 minutes before the top of the hour. I'll, I should have this done in four or five minutes and therefore we'll have 15 minutes or so for your questions. Do be sure to put them in the Q&A uh, rather than in the chat um, in order for us to, to go ahead and answer those and Munir will help us uh, uh, take a look at those in just a few minutes. Okay, um, some really exciting things coming up for uh, for our community in the coming year. Um, in, uh, uh, in no particular order, uh, we are uh, at awarding the Fulbright Prize this year uh, to Gary White and Matt Damon. Uh, these are the founders and leaders of water.org and water equity. Uh, these are institutions that have very effectively over a number of years uh, promoted safe water and better sanitation for millions of people around the planet. Um, uh, Obviously, Matt Damon is more famous for his work in Hollywood, but he is at heart a philanthropist and his his partner, Gary White. Uh, the two of them have done amazing uh, work around the planet. It's not as well known, of course, uh, but uh, uh, Gary is uh, an incredibly innovative um, uh, uh, philanthropist and leader. It's an amazing team, and we're excited to, to acknowledge their work. Uh, at the prize, May 16th, here in Washington. I can talk more about that. I could talk about that all evening, but uh, I'll move on. We are going to be doing advocacy a slightly different way this year. Uh, we want to, uh, a lot of our programs need to be more accessible to our members. So rather than just having events in one particular city or another, we want to be able to offer some digital opportunities. These are the these is what uh, this is what Bob was making reference to uh, just a minute ago. Uh, we want people to be able to participate even if they don't have the time or the resources uh, or cannot make the distance uh, to join us. Uh, advocacy will be taking place at two levels. Our chapters in in districts across the country, although they can do this digitally as well, will be meeting with House representatives and their district offices to make the point that the Fulbright program has an impact in communities across America. Our national effort will be focused on the Senate. We've decided that uh, there are so many senators uh, across this country who do not know the Fulbright program well. We have focused a lot of our efforts in the last couple of years on appropriators. Makes sense, they are the ones that make decisions on money. But uh, but now we think it's there. That's too much of a political vulnerability. We have to 
expand our vision on this and ex increase the, the number of folks we, we talk to. Uh, we're going to be launching uh, later this year what we call the Fulbright Ideas Exchange. This will be an effort to draw from the full Fulbright community across the globe their ideas, policy uh, um, solutions, research findings, stories, and more, uh, and then share those out in social media. Um, we're, again, this is an opportunity for people to engage digitally from wherever they are and a unique opportunity for, for Fulbrighters outside of the United States who could never come to, say, our conference, a chance to contribute their, their thoughts about the future. We'll be doing, as promised in the strategy, a hybrid conference. Um, this, will, uh, this will take place in October. We're doing this in two pieces. Not, it's not a classic hybrid where you, you, you're doing this simultaneously. We will have a digital conference first uh, in a week of October. In just a second, Monir is going to launch a quick poll that we want to take of your thoughts on this. And then uh, on October 26th, Saturday the 26th, we'll do uh, an in-person day conference that really stresses the social aspect of being together. Um, so what I'm gonna have uh, Munir do is go ahead and launch that, that very, very quick poll. Let me explain what, uh, what we're asking. What we're asking you to do is to tell us um, as we schedule this digital, what would be your preference? We've given you three sets of dates. You can choose any of the or any or all of these. So it would be on a Wednesday or Thursday. In other words, everything during a week day. It could be Friday and Saturday, obviously straddling a, a, a weekend, or it could be a just a weekend itself. Um, so go ahead and keep uh, keep uh, registering for that. It's really exciting to see those numbers change. Um, isn't that interesting? I, I'm, I'm watching it live, and uh, uh, it, it's a bit like watching a horse race right now. So it, keep uh, we'll announce the results of that in in just a minute. Um, uh, let me move on uh, quickly. Um, Throughout the year, we'll have chapter events. Uh, those, as mentioned, uh, powered by an ECA grant, which we greatly appreciate. You should check out our calendar. It is jammed every month with chapter events across the country, give you a sense of all the things that are going on. And please attend those uh, events as, you, as they're near to you. Um, we are working on uh, opening new chapters and interest groups uh, in Riverside, California. We have a group uh, representing community colleges. We have three new states, uh, Wisconsin, Wyoming, and North Dakota. We're really excited to expand our, our state reach. Uh, West Texas, we already have four or five chapters in Texas. Uh, Texans apparently cannot get enough of this association. So we're super excited about that. And then our list of six interest groups, country-based interest groups will grow by two with India and Thailand. Um, it's ex the, the response to these two new countries has been amazing. I am uh, an alum of the India program, as I mentioned. The interest in, in leading and engaging with the other folks connected with India is so inspiring. I'm so happy about that. Uh, and, and finally, um, a call to action. My colleagues, uh, both Bob and Will, have suggested ways that you can get engaged. Uh, and I'm, I'm, so I'm repeating some of the things they're saying. In mid-February, our new Salesforce uh, member portal will be open for you to go in and update your profile. We, we need more information about our alumni to better address their needs. So I uh, look out for a, a an announcement on that. There'll be online tutorials, you know, a quick video to to uh, orient yourself to the new system. As Bob uh, mentioned, so did Will. You know, please promote uh, us to your friends, your uh, your cohort of other Fulbrighters, and your university. Uh, connect to your chapters. Attend an event. Come to the prize. It's going to be it's going to be great. Help us get sponsors. Uh, Will mentioned. Uh, the importance of that for our financial strength. Uh, when asked to participate in advocacy, please do that. We want to 
if we're going to if we're going to meet all 100 senators, we're going to want constituents from every state to stand up and uh, online and t tell their stories about their Fulbright program. Um, attend the conference again, available digitally and in person, and finally to donate uh, as you can and and when you can to support our our programs and mission. And we're we're very grateful to you. Okay. Um, uh, we will shift now to Q and A. Um, uh, Munir, is the uh, are the results now settled? Have we got as many people as we want? There we go. Okay, so it's uh, it's very interesting. Um, uh, for this poll, we've got forty four percent saying that the Wednesday and Thursday would work well for them. Uh, now, again, these are overlapping because you could vote for more than one. 57% uh, saying Friday and Saturday. So that is the, the largest of the three. And then finally, Saturday and Sunday is uh, basically tied at 46. Uh, so we appreciate your your suggestions on that. Um, and uh, my team will take note of those numbers. Right, guys? Um, okay, I'll stop sharing. And uh, and go to the Q and A. Okay, um, I'll answer the first one. Uh, this is from Phil Rakita. Will the slides be available to us after this meeting? Yes, absolutely. We'll offer those slides, um, and uh, we're also recording this because, of course, many members are not on this call, and they should um, they should uh, have access to this. Um, uh, next, uh, I guess I'll answer this one as well. When will the next FA annual conference be abroad? Have you decided where? What countries are you considering? That's a good question, Nada, because we have in the past, as you well know, done our conference overseas. This year, we we looked at that very seriously, but it was extremely expensive to go overseas. Uh, it's also uh, a question of access because a lot of our members cannot afford to go to a foreign uh, conference, and we were very concerned that this would be exclusive uh, to them when we want to we want to uh, expand our reach uh, on conferences. We haven't ruled this out for the future, but uh, for now we're we're going to stick with the the hybrid idea. Uh, maybe a question for for Bob. How are you building a diverse leadership team? I'd love to be more active. Do you need to live in DC? And you're muted, Bob. I'm not so, muted. Ha. Either. <laughs> ha, good, you got me. All right. Yeah. Um, actually, your willingness to be active is terrific. Um, you don't need to live in DC. The only one on screen right now who lives in DC is John. Um, but you do need occasionally to come to DC if you're interested in serving on the board, but there are other ways of being involved. Um, John, who on the staff would be the best person uh, for Vicki to talk to about specific ways to get involved? Well, um, uh, probably Christine, who is uh, who who leads as, as associate director for chapters. Um, uh, Vicki, you'll see that, um, again, with chapters across the country and with interest groups, which are functioning online, um, you, you don't need to live in D.C. at all. Uh, you, you could live in Indonesia for, if, you were, if you were interested in an interest group. Um, so um, uh, do reach out to Christine. It, her, her email is christine at fulbright.org. Um, and you're quite right. We're very much interested in engaging uh, a wide number of folks in uh, in our programming. So a great, great question. Um, a question from uh, Kirsty. I regularly work with the Minnesota delegation in the course of my work and would be interested in learning more about advocacy. How can I learn more? I have not been yet active with the chapter. Thank you. Will, you are a, a, a regular advocate um, and on our advocacy committee. Maybe you'd like to take a stab at this question. Well, the, the first way to get involved would uh, be to look at 
Every year we produce a, a document that we, uh, we give to congressmen and senators about the, the program and what we hope for the next year to get a copy of that document and staff can send you a copy of that document. The second thing to do is, uh, is to get involved with your local chapter and when advocacy time comes up for the local chapters to talk to uh, congressmen in their districts at their district offices. This is a lot easier than coming to DC and trying to catch congressmen or senators in their offices here. Please do that. It's a very effective way because it shows that there actually is local interest in supporting Fulbright. The third way to do it is uh, to come to D.C. for the uh, Senate uh, program, the advocacy program in D.C., and to join one of the groups which uh, is, is highly organized that John and his staff put together uh, to go to congressional offices. So you can do it in three ways. You can do it on your own by uh, using that document uh, as kind of a basis for your argument. You can do it with your uh, local chapter by going to local congressional offices, or you can come to D.C. Uh, Heather asks a similar question, uh, a strategic uh, question about um, uh, the importance of, for example, of Republican appropriators, uh, which is a very good point. Um, the uh, the fact that uh, at the district level, the, those staff are not directly involved in appropriations, and that is true. What we're trying to do, Heather, is to widen awareness of the Fulbright program. Right now, we have been focused on people who already know the program. The uh, uh, appropriators, both Republican and Democrat, are very familiar with what we're talking about. Um, we are not excluding them. We're still going to be visiting with them. In fact, uh, we have a, a pro bono consultant, a lobbying firm that helps uh, me and my team. They're going to be organizing one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings, uh, well, sort of small group meetings between me my team, and appropriation staff on both sides. Very important set of uh, contacts. Um, we've been building relationships with Republican appropriators for years, uh, and we will continue to do that. Um, okay, next question is uh, anonymous. What is the plan for Fulbright mentorship in 2024? I would ask my colleague, uh, Fiona, to take this question, but I will. We are uh, continually expanding the number of people who are engaged in this. We're going to um, we're going to be using a new platform to allow people to get matched more readily, um, and uh, and we're looking for more. Frankly, we're looking for more people to participate. So. If you're interested in mentorship, please send Fiona an email. She's at Fiona at Fulbright.org. Um, uh, Vicki asked the question, when is the prize? Mark it on your calendar. Yes, it's Thursday, May 16th. Thursday, May 16th. Just a little over, well, it's a little less than four months from now. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I'll keep on going. When is the national conference? So as we mentioned, the in-person conference will be Saturday, October 26th here in Washington. We're still working on the theme. Um, we are uh, one of our uh, uh, sort of working themes is uh, is what we're calling crossroads. Um, so we are at a crossroads as as a planet, politically, culturally, um, environmentally. So crossroads might be the theme. Um, so we're well, we're still we're still baking that. Um, uh, next question from Amy: What were what or were the guidelines to pick the Fulbright Prize winners? We actually have the chair of the Fulbright Prize Selection Committee. We're looking right at you. That's Bob. Maybe right. you can talk um, a little bit about uh, guidelines, criteria. What powered the decision to choose Gary and Matt? Sure. Um, the board has a document, and I don't know, John, if that document can be made available to the membership, um, it's on the board portal. Uh, and, and, and actually, the document has remained remarkably stable for many years, ever since uh, really the first award of the prize to Nelson Mandela in I forget what year that was, John, I should remember. 93. 93. Um, the, uh, the guidelines very much, very simply, are individuals or organizations 
for either a single action or an ongoing action or commitment. Uh, individuals or organizations who best exemplify and contribute to the Fulbright vision and mission of a peaceful world through um, citizen diplomacy, solving global problems. And so it doesn't have to be directly related to the cessation of hostilities. Uh, and in fact, we had a lot of conversation around that because water.org is about world peace through access to basic water and sanitation. And, um, and it actually took a lot, a number of people said, well, gee, that's not directly related to uh, stopping war. But the more you, I thought about it, the more people thought about it, it was like, yeah, fundamental resources, the absence of fundamental resources often are the cause of war. And there is no more fundamental resource than water and effective sanitation. And to have an organization that uh, has done so much, if you, if you, if you Google water dot, look at water.org, um, you'll, you'll be very impressed. And, and their rating by nonprofit rating organizations is very impressive as well. So basically what happens is there's a nomination uh, period. John, the office, John and his team send out to the whole membership uh, an, an invitation to suggest possible individuals or organizations to who would receive the prize. And then there is a committee composed, uh, the majority of whom are uh, board members, but there are also other members invited to join the committee uh, on an annual basis. Last year, we had the uh, U.S., the uh, um, the uh, what a foreign ambassador who was also a Fulbrighter who is based now in the U.S. who was able to from uh, Uruguay from Uruguay yes uh, was able to be part of the of the committee um, I will no longer be chair of the committee since I'll be chairing the board but we will have excellent leadership um, next year uh, and you should then be seeing an invitation to su to suggest names in the not too distant future, really. Agreed. Um, we are uh, we started at five past the hour, so I'm going to try to be respectful of uh, ending at the top at the what would be the new top of the hour in two or three two or three minutes. So let me quickly run through some answers of remaining questions the best I can. If you feel that your questions have not been answered or you have more questions to pose to us. Please send us an email. You, that can go to info at fulbright.org uh, at any time. And um, and then uh, Fiona or and, and her colleagues who answer that can forward that to the right person. Uh, all right, quickly, uh, Phil asked the question, why is the annual meeting not coincident with the annual conference? That goes to our the importance of being inclusive and accessible. So we wanted to do uh, this, uh, this membership meeting uh, digitally. We also felt that uh, it would be better and more accurate to report to you end of year financials as the, with the books closed. So that's the reason why we did this on February 1st and not earlier. Our final financials were closed about uh, a week ago. Um, and those were the numbers that, uh, that Will reported to you. Um, my chapter is not very active. Can I still stay active? Absolutely. We've given you a number of opportunities digitally to, to be involved, but you can also uh, lean into it and reach out to Christine and say, I'd like to help my chapter be more active. Uh, one of the things we're working on is to improve chapter communication so that you know what's going on and we'll be better supporting them throughout the year. Um, let's see. Um, Regional conference, yeah, I would love to offer a regional conference, but we think again that uh, access is a is a critical question. Um, could we do it on various themes? Absolutely, but I think that Fulbright Ideas Exchange will be a good place to to do that. Um, let's see, uh, some of these have already been answered. Uh, Irene asked the question: To which of your missions should a potential donor best direct a donation of five thousand dollars? Or is it better to mention several areas to direct funds? 
Um, I, Irene, we can talk to you offline on this. You could talk to me or you could talk to Claire, Claire at Fulbright.org. Um, she is our philanthropy director. Uh, the answer to that is our preference is for an unrestricted gift to our general fund. Uh, but if you would like to have a conversation about how to restrict your gifts, we can absolutely do that. We want uh, all of our donors to be happy with, with what we are doing. Um, let's see. I'll try to do two more questions. Is the travel program to Nepal going forward? Yes. Right now we have every indication that we can do both uh, um, uh, sides of the Nepal trip. Uh, the, the, um, the earlier part of the trip is a little under under registered um the what's called the cultural uh, piece is a little bit better registered so we th we're quite confident we'll be able to do both of these in in the spring um let's see let me jump down to a good question about engaging younger folks this is a high priority of the association is to is to be uh, and this is vital to our future we can't we, we can't survive as an organization without young leadership and without uh, without engagement from young people, uh, Bob, would you like to comment on that, and then perhaps draw us to a close? I mean, I, I don't know what what I can say except that it is a very heartfelt uh, desire for all of us to engage younger people. That's why I've been in higher education for most of my career. Um, I, I guess if you if you've seen uh, well. Let's not think of older and younger. Let's just think of yeah. all of us here on the planet for a relatively short time who want to work together for the good of all to build a peaceful world. Don't let age be a barrier, just as you don't want any other uh, piece of identification to be a barrier, whether it's religion, race, uh, geography. Um, it so happens that older Fulbrighters probably have more time but it doesn't. But if you uh, have time, that is terrific. Just just forge ahead. You will be warmly welcomed. And I'm happy so, to talk to anybody offline about this, um, because encouraging younger people to get involved is really a passion of mine. I will note that our um, our uh, membership for young professionals is only thirty dollars a year. That's uh, that's a very low number we have a lot of chapters who need young leadership to energize and to offer new ideas so there are lots of chapter opportunities uh, let me let uh will uh s sign off as well and i'll say i'll say good night to all of you in just a second i i just wanted to make a point uh, please that that uh you you would you might think from the fact that the three of us are old white guys uh on this call that the that the board is not interested in diversity and inclusion. Uh, the executive committee is much more diverse, uh, six people on the executive committee, and the boards, and particularly the intake of new members, is much more diverse. Uh, Fulbright, as you know, uh, had a reputation of being a segregationist, uh, not only a reputation, but a reality of being a segregationist. And uh, his obituary from uh, the Washington Post uh, said that there were four great issues of the day that Fulbright was involved in. One was McCarthyism, and he was on the right side of McCarthyism, on the correct side, I should say, of McCarthyism. Second was the Vietnam War, and he opposed the Vietnam War, and he was on the correct side of the Vietnam War. The thing that he is known for around the world, of course, is the international education and the Fulbright program, and that was a wonderful achievement. But his role as a uh, supporter of uh, segregation was something that would keep him from being recognized as one of the great men of our uh, 20th century. Um, and we want to acknowledge that, and we want to acknowledge that that background of Fulbright, but we don't want it to take away from the, the wonderful impact that Fulbright has, the Fulbright program has in terms of international education and the issues Bob and John talked about, about promoting world peace. And we do want you to know that we are very seriously concerned about the issues of uh, inclusion. Thank you very much. Um, so just speaking for my colleagues, I'll, I'll thank you all again for your engagement, for your membership, for your support, uh, all that you do all year long. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening, wherever you are. Please spread the word, um, get, get involved, and uh, we look forward to seeing you very shortly. Thank you all. Thank Good night, you. everybody. Take care. Be well.